Coffee, Cows, and Crops is produced by the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association and hosted by Extension Coordinator Johanna Murray. On this podcast, we discuss management practices and research results with scientists, ranchers, researchers, and farmers. We strive to share innovative information and farming practices supported by sound science and practical wisdom. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get learning. Everybody, thank you for tuning in today. Today I'm talking to Megan Payne, the Executive Director from Lesser Slave Watershed Council, uh, about their water quality monitoring programs and uh, what they do at LSWC. Before we get started uh, on all of that though, Megan, can you introduce yourself and how you got involved with the Lesser Slave Watershed Council? You bet. Thank you for inviting me to join you today, Joanna. This is my first podcast. I mean, I've listened to plenty, but my first one I've participated in. So as you mentioned, I'm the executive director here for the Lesser Slave Watershed Council, and I've actually been in this position since 2008. And in addition to myself, we also have a watershed coordinator. Uh, Her name is Kate Loveson, and she works with me in the office and takes the lead on delivering some of our education programs and planning outreach events and activities to share information about the watershed. Awesome. Uh, So you have a couple of projects that I think are pretty cool, but before we get into uh, what we're talking about today, how about you give us a bit of an intro of what exactly it is that LSWC does? Okay, I'll try not to get too technical and we're long here, but in a nutshell, um, I mentioned that the LSWC is a watershed planning and advisory council. We'll say we call we call ourselves WPACs for short. So there's 11 of us across the province and all the watersheds in Alberta, except for the top Northwest corner are covered by a watershed planning advisory council. Um, All of us do similar type at our different areas of the province and they fall into four main categories. Um, We we're conveners and collaborators, which I find awkward to say, but it captures the way that we bring people together to talk about water and our watershed and watershed issues and work with uh, people in the watershed from, you know, provincial, municipal, indigenous government, industry stakeholders, like-minded organizations to do projects that promote healthy watersheds. So we have a series of partners who are working together uh, to support landowners and producers in planning and implementing on the ground projects that help benefit their operation and lead to environmental improvements over time. So that's an example of a bunch of partners coming together for a shared common goal. And if anyone's interested in learning more about our watershed resiliency work, you guys could reach out to me and I'd be happy to chat more about it. Um, Another role of WPACs is in monitoring and reporting. So compiling information that's available about our watershed. things about fish, water quality, uh, our precipitation climate, um, industrial statistics, all the information that's available to us. And then we um, use different indicators to identify uh, if the watershed is healthy or meeting a good range of criteria or not so healthy. And then through this process, we also find out where the data gaps are. And if you have a lot of data gaps, that prevents really a proper assessment and prevents us from understanding our watershed. So we did our first state of the watershed report in 2008 and there was a lot of data gaps. Um, just monitoring is expensive and you know in northern Alberta water issues haven't been prevalent for as long with, as in southern Alberta where there's more drought and more population. So there's just hasn't been as much technical work done in the north I find. Mm, right. Another area that WPACs work in is uh, supporting planning and policy. So uh, all of us across the province are working on what we call integrated watershed management plans. So we bring we bring in all the people to the table, uh, municipalities, our provincial government, indigenous groups, uh, landowners from agriculture, forest industry folks, oil and gas, tourism, economic development, and have everybody agree that these goals and objectives that we're going to set for a healthy watershed are are something that we all commit to and that we all want to see. So it's not it's not easy. <laughs> There's a lot of communication, a lot of engagement, a lot of work went into it. So we worked on our IWMP, our watershed plan from 2016 to 2019. And it was it was an eye opener of how much work goes into an exercise like this. But now we are focused on uh, working with the partners that uh, 
partners around the watershed to implement some of the recommended recommendations and actions in the plan. So the planning work, I mean, planning is never really done. It goes in cycles, but we're into the implementation and project phase of our planning. Nice. And then last but not least, by far, uh, education and literacy. So we want people to be doing better on the land, doing better in their jobs, doing better for the environment and the watershed in general. But what does that mean? They first have to understand um, how a watershed works and how the things we do influence it and what that all means. So we have a lot of programs and projects and opportunities for learning. So we have a watershed coordinator who, who works in the office with me and they take the lead on that. And then the organization itself, the Watershed Council, is actually a board of directors. We're a nonprofit charitable organization, and the board oversees uh, the governance policy direction and things like that. Where and the two staff, me and uh, our coordinator, we take the lead on implementing all those things and doing our projects and delivering our programs. Great. And you cover quite a bit of area too for the Lesser Slave Watershed, right? Yeah, I mean, compared to the Peace Watershed, which is like 30% of Alberta, I feel lucky to have kind of a smaller <laughs> watershed so that I can get to all of it. But our office is located in High Prairie and, and our watershed area actually includes all the land that drains into Lesser Slave Lake and the Lesser Slave River. So if you're picturing our lake, all the land around it that with the rivers that feed into it. So geographically, we go from about just west of High Prairie, uh, east all the way to about Smith, Alberta, and the north south we go from about the town of Swan Hills to as far north as Peavine Métis Settlement. So there's quite an area there. It's like 12,000 kilometers squared. Wow. Yeah. There you go. So with uh, all the intros out of the way now, um, let's talk about the really exciting part, which is the projects. I've heard a little bit about like your your water river water quality project that you've been working on the last couple of years. Um, so can you give us a bit of a background on that project and how you got it started? Yeah, for sure. So I mentioned um, that we did a state of the watershed report back in 2008. And one of the big learnings was uh, we don't have enough information about the streams that flow into Lester Slave Lake to really say much about their health, because in the past, there just hasn't been much monitoring done or it's out of date, you know, from the 80s and 90s. There's also no river network stations anywhere in our watershed. So other watersheds, uh, like big watersheds like the Athabasca and the Peace, on the main stems of those rivers, there are, are monitoring stations that are continually collecting information, but there are none of these anywhere in our watershed. So um, back in 2006, when we began working on the watershed management plan, uh, it became evident that uh, a monitoring program was a priority. So we pulled together the resources, making a plan and getting grants and finding partners and, and all of that. So monitoring on the tributaries became a high priority in our planning because in order to manage a lake, you need to understand what's flowing into it. Um, there's five major tributaries, the South Hart River, the East and West Prairie Rivers, the Drift Pile River and the Swan River and there's flow monitoring stations on each of these rivers, but that's it. So the only thing we know from those flow stations is how much water approximately comes into the lake a year. So in 2016, we began looking for funding and partners, and then we implemented the first year of the field program in 2017. So the program has 15 sites on the five tributaries that I named, and we sample them 10 times starting in April and then ending about mid-October. And right. these 15 sites were chosen based on um, where there had been samples done in the past. So Alberta Environment and Parks has some, some sample sites that were on record. So we tried to match those so that we had data that was comparable. And then also we pick uh, sites that were easy to access because obviously you have to be able to safely get there and we have to get there to sample them and you know how it is in northern Alberta in the summer it could be a lot of mud or who knows what <laughs> yep um so I guess to follow up on all of that is um <clears throat> since we're we're short on data so that's sort of why you got this started but what sort of information can you get out of this this water monitoring 
uh, project? Well, the Watershed Council has been working with people and the top concerns we hear are things like, can I eat these fish? Can I swim in the lake? What happens if I, what if I drink the water out of the river, right? People want to know that the water is safe and clean and that they can use it. So um, we've been hearing this over and over again, but um, monitoring is expensive. So we had to make a plan that would give us the best bang for our buck. So some of the major issues that we hear are, um, Sediment. Sediment. There's a lot of erosion. We live in a part of the province that has really soft soils. You know, we're not in the Canadian Shield. We're in the boreal forest. So there's a lot of erosion. And with that, sediment gets washed downstream. And sediment can, um, you know, it falls out of the water column and deposits over spawning grounds. So that's not great for fish. Um, it clogs the gills of aquatic organisms um, and causes other water quality issues like turbidity and lower oxygen. A lot of people also want to know if there's bacteria in our rivers. So, you know, people will see, you know, cattle pastured near a water body and they'll have concerns, is, you know, is there manure getting into the river? How do we know? So we also test fecal coliform bacteria. It's an indicator of how, how many fecal coliforms are in the water. Um, they're only found in the guts of mammals. So it's an indicator we use to look at. Uh, whether or not there would be fecal contamination. So either from wild animals, from an, uh, confined animals like livestock, or even from humans, if septic systems aren't functioning properly. Right. Uh, nutrients. So you'll hear people say, algae, why is there so much algae on the lake this year? Algae is gross. Some types of algae like blue-green algae are toxic. So algal blooms are a concern. And uh, so we test for nutrients because we know that nutrients kind of drive algal blooms. Uh, we test for total and dissolved nutrients. Um, we also look at a bunch of routine parameters um, that we measure in the field. Uh, there's also concerns with other types of contaminants in the water, such as metals or, you know, hydrocarbons. We have oil and gas activity, that sort of thing. But when you're developing a monitoring program, you have to be mindful of the cost of analytics. Um, so as a nonprofit, we had to be really mindful of uh, implementing a program that we could get key information that tells us about the issues of concern, while at the same time being affordable so that we can carry it forward from year to year. I uh, remember seeing one of your presentations here a year or so ago, and you mentioned that uh, with those fecal coliforms, like you could identify what class of animal, it, it, whether it come from deer or beavers or birds or that sort yes. of stuff. Yes, interesting sidebar. Yeah. So we worked with the University of Alberta uh, School of Public Health. We sent our water quality samples to them out of the West Prairie River because we had been seeing high fecal coliform counts in 2017 and 18. So in 2019, we said, well, let's look into this further. So it's called eDNA. Um, basically, they can um, take the fecal coliforms from the sample and grow them and then examine them and find, like determine what DNA markers are in each coliform colony and determine what species it came from. So um, we had seven species that were looked at. So there was geese, humans, of course, beaver, um, ruminant, which includes cows, deer, elk, animals with the ruminant type stomachs. And there's another one, I believe ducks. So from the samples we took in 2019, um, just quick, a quick breakdown of what we <laughs> learned. We learned that about 85% of the coliforms that were being found in those samples were from a ruminant source. There was actually zero human markers found, which is good because that means our septic and water wastewater systems are not faulty along that river system. And then there was trace of beaver in all of them, just a trace amount. So, but we do know there's lots of beavers in this watershed. So that was really interesting. So I kind of did confirm, uh, you know, the, well, we had some suspicions that, you know, it was runoff from, you know, confined, confined feeding sites from overwintering and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. then knowing that the coliforms are from a ruminant source that helped us target our, uh, our, education and engagement, and then also led into working with landowners and, and doing some watershed resiliency work. 
Yeah, well, and it's it's cool to be able to have those numbers to to show people and go, yes, we did that. We we did that research, and this is what we found out. Absolutely, and and part of the goal of monitoring is to to see change over time, right? So Definitely. we have a five year water quality record, and if we you know check again in twenty years from now, we'd be able to see how things have changed because mm -hmm. there's actually information available. <laughs> <laughs> Always exciting. So on the topic of testing, um, what other things do you test for and how, how do those tests work? Well, uh, we here, we bought our, some equipment. So we have what's called a water quality zone and that's a expensive piece of equipment that needs to be calibrated before we go out in the field with uh, various chemical solutions to ensure that it's reading accurately. And our zone measures temperature, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, and pH. So why do we care about that stuff? Well, temperature and dissolved oxygen are pretty important for fish. <laughs> we know that. Um, th if it's too warm and the water has low oxygen, it won't be able to sustain fish. And sport fishing in this watershed is really popular and we have really great fishery. Um, and I mentioned algae already. Uh, conductivity and pH are indicators of what other uh, ions and particles are in the water. So we know that um, metals and salts conduct electricity. So conductivity reading is a quick way to know if your, your water sample is really high in ions. And then maybe that would direct you to spend more money sampling metals or and dissolved ions and that sort of thing. Right. So, in it, so we measure those things in the field. We wade out with our chest waders out into the middle of the stream and we use our equipment to measure that. And then we also collect bottles of samples that we send to the lab. So depending on what you want to measure that you get a different bottle and maybe it has a preservative. So when we sample for nutrients, we collect a bottle for total nutrients and a bottle for dissolved nutrients and the bottle of total nutrients is preserved with an acid. And that's important because it stops the, uh, any biological processes from happening in the sample. Uh, so when you're planning out your how, what you're going to sample, you need you need to be mindful of whether or not it, what color of bottle it needs. Some of them, um, like chlorophyll A, no light can penetrate the sample once it's collected, so they come in a black bottle. Um, the lab that you work with sends you all the correct stuff, but you got to make a plan well ahead of time so that you have the proper supplies. So we collect samples for nutrients, we collect a bottle for fecal coliform bacteria, and we collect one for a total dissolved solids and total suspended solids, and we send those to ALS Laboratory in Edmonton. On the Swan River and a few of our other river sites, we're also collecting metals monthly. So that is a pricier sample. So we do that one monthly rather than 10 times a year. And mm -hmm. same thing, we preserve our total metal samples and total mercury and send them off to the lab. Awesome. So uh, the other issue that always comes to mind for me when we're talking about water quality is that um, spring breakup is <laughs> is always a something that can make uh, your surface water quality get pretty dicey. And I think that's about when this episode's going to go up is around the time of spring break breakup. So what sort of trends do you see in the water quality throughout the year? And what have you seen year over year? Well, you're right about spring breakup. <laughs> we, well, you picture all that snow melting and washing the landscape, basically, right? You're giving it a flush and all that water carries whatever's in that snow or on the surface of the ground with it into the nearest stream. So uh, you're, you're right in that we, we do generally see the poorest water quality during spring runoff or other times like in July, August. Uh, when it rains heavily and the rivers are really high and really full of runoff. Um, in, this, in the summer when we just have normal flows, we see that the water quality is generally better. Um, there's usually better oxygen levels in the spring versus the middle of summer in the hot, hot days because uh, colder water holds more oxygen than warmer water, which is important for fish. 
So I mentioned that uh, in the summer, when it gets really hot, we see stream temperatures get really warm. So, you know, in, in April, when we're taking our temperature measurements and collecting our samples, we're almost getting, you know, freezing our fingers because the water's only one or two degrees versus say the middle of a hot summer day in August, the water temperature can be all the way up to, you know, I've seen 24 degrees. Oh, so wow. some fish, yeah, some fish are really resilient to changes in temperature like the white nose sucker is one that lives in the streams that we've been sampling and those fish are tough they can tolerate pretty warm temperatures pretty you know they can they can tolerate those turbid times when the river is really full of sediment and the water quality is not as great whereas the arctic grayling which is actually a species at risk they're way more sensitive to changes in their water quality which is why they're at risk. <laughs> so, <laughs> duh. <laughs> so the Arctic graylings way more sensitive to changes in temperature and oxygen level, and they need those colder temperatures and higher oxygen levels. So they like to be in rocky little small channels in the Swan Hills that uh, are shaded by trees and that don't, don't get heated up by the sun, like some of the bigger rivers. Right. So, uh, I hear you're also getting started on like a lake monitoring project this year, in addition to all of the tributaries and stuff. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So we, we are going to start lake water quality monitoring this month, actually. Oh, Starting right it off January 2021. So I mentioned um, that developing a monitoring program for the tributaries was a high priority. Uh, and so was monitoring for Lesser Slave Lake. Um, Lesser Slave Lake's the biggest accessible lake in Alberta and has one of the best port fisheries in Alberta. And there's not really any monitoring being done by the government. Um, and the sampling that has been done in the past has not been really done regularly and it's, it's dated. So this is also a priority out of our plan, better understanding of the lake and how, how it's functioning as a system, along with the tributaries and the water coming in. So uh, we've been able to secure funding to do samples on Lester Slave Lake eight times throughout 2021. So if you're picturing Lester Slave Lake, it's kind of long. It's, it's like 110 kilometers long and it's kind of pinched in the middle. We call that the narrows. So it's actually kind of treated as two basins when we're looking at, at lake processes and lake systems. And most of the tributaries come in on the west side of the lake and the east side of the lake uh, is deeper and doesn't have as many tributaries coming in. So that, that's enough of a difference to, to, do, to treat them as kind of two, two separate lakes that are attached. <laughs> So we have a site in, in the middle of the East Basin and the middle of the West Basin. And we've, we've we didn't choose these sites. These are sites that were sampled in the past. So we're gonna do three under ice samples. So January, February, and March. And then uh, when the lake, the ice is off the lake, we're gonna get out there in June and do monthly samples from June to October. Cool. And uh, lake monitoring is quite a bit different than stream monitoring. Uh, rivers are flowing systems, so you need the flow information when you're looking at the water quality. And rivers change rapidly, right? Based on snowmelt or the amount of rain we get, they change quite quickly, whereas lakes don't. So Lesser Slave Lake has a huge volume of water in it, really huge. So we don't see rapid changes. They're more gradual over time. Um, but lakes do cycle seasonally. They, they do it. It's called turning over. So it's based on temperature layers. Um, in the summer, uh, the sun shines through a, to a certain depth where uh, we call that the depth of penetration. And then um, the cooler water is trapped beneath that. So picture warm water on the top and then cooler water underneath in the summer. And then fall comes along and it gets cold fast and the water temperature drops. And when water temperature goes down, it actually becomes more dense little back to school lesson. So the density gets greater and the warm water falls down, uh, basically essentially mixing the layers. Oh, interesting. So, so at different times of the year, the temperature profiles are changing and this mixes the water and brings with it, you know, the different, whatever's in the water at those different layers. And if uh, it cycles all the way to the bottom, it can churn up sediment. And then the, the sediment usually has, you know, phosphorus and, and different nutrients in it as well. 
another thing with lakes, um, algae, right? We, we often don't see yeah. algae in, in the flowing rivers because it kind of, it grows where there's an accumulation of nutrients and the water's warmer. So we generally don't see it on the rivers here, but we do see it on the lake. So depending on how many nutrients are available in the lake, algal blooms can become pretty big. Um, there's lots of factors that determine how fast they're going to grow, such as the temperature. If we have a really above average warm summer, we will see greater algal blooms on the lake by, say, September than we would on a cooler year. Right. Um, there's actually a satellite image that was taken about a decade ago, and it captures, a, I don't know the year of it, but it's NASA took it, and it captures a huge algal bloom, and it looks like it covers about half the surface of Lesser Slave Lake. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it's really big. And I mean, it doesn't stay like that for long, right? In the, in the fall, when the temperatures drop, uh, the algae dies and decomposes, which is also which can also cause water quality issues because we know decomposing plant matter uses oxygen rather than creates it. So right. algae is kind of problematic. So our lake, prob our lake program is going to look at the same parameters as the river program, but we're adding chlorophyll A. So by looking at the chlorophyll, that'll give us information about how much algae is growing. Okay, right on. It sounds like you've got a lot of really good data out of this project so far and looking to get more. So what happens to the data you collect? Like where, where does it go and is it publicly available? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the behind the, the behind the scenes, not glamorous part. Um, I spend a lot of time um, entering our field measurements, the lab reports, we have photos we keep on record. Um, and it's all in a spreadsheet every year um, so that we can send it to our environmental consultant at the end of the season. So between November and, and January, they work on a water quality summary report for us. They also pull the precipitation and climate data from our weather stations in the area and they get the river flow data from the government and then look at our sample results and give us a summary report for each year that's basically a snapshot of what we saw for that year and um, those summary reports um, are on our website and you can go there and download them and check them out but if you're interested in viewing the data online we have a partnership with uh, well, we're a partner with McKenzie Data Stream, and they host a platform where um, community groups or basically any organization can host their water quality information, and it can be viewed and accessed by anybody. So it's actually pretty cool. You just have to go to, uh, it's mckenziedatastream.ca, and there's a little section that says explore the data and it pops up the whole McKenzie Basin. So we're kind of at the Southern reach of that. And then when you zoom in on the Lesser Slave Lake area, all of our sample sites pop up. And when you click on them, it'll show all the different um, parameters. So oxygen, temperature, conductivity, nutrients, all the different parameters that we've measured and you can look at them there. It'll, uh, it'll build you graphs and charts and stuff, and you can put a couple of the sites together and compare them. So it's a pretty cool way to make our data accessible to folks. Yeah, that's awesome. We also um, share it, obviously, with the government of Alberta and then any, you know, project, any partners that would ask for it for use in, in projects or, you know, work that they're doing, um, we'd be happy to share it. Awesome. And uh, for anybody interested in all of that stuff, I will put the link to both the Lesser Slave Watershed Council website and the McKenzie Data Stream website in the description. So you can go check those out. Oh, thanks, out. Joanna. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if anybody is like super keen and they want more information about anything, you can always reach out to me too. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about for uh, when we're talking about the project? Is there anything that you've missed? Well, you I do want to recognize our partners and funders because, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit and without support from a multitude of places, we wouldn't be able to implement projects like this. So in terms of funding, uh, we were really lucky to be able to secure five years of support from the Vanderwell Forest Resource Improvement Program grant. And then we've also got significant support from uh, West Fraser, Big Lakes County, Cardinal Energy, Plains Midstream, and uh, and a few, you know, $1,000, $2,000 uh, handful of those supporters as well. Um, Swan River First Nation, 
is uh, working with us as well. Um, they, they're they obviously concerned more about the Swan River region because that's their traditional territory and that's kind of the area that they all live in. So on the Swan River, we collect metal samples at the three sites and Swan River First Nation covers the costs of the analytical and sometimes their staff will come out in the field with us and help us gather samples for the day. So um, I think that equals about $4,000 a year and is helping us build a more robust data set on the Swan River. And we're also working with them on a few other things. So this, this sparked kind of more work that we're doing together. Well, that's awesome. And then going forward, um, the town of Slave Lake would like to add a monitoring site on the Lesser Slave River. We didn't initially build one into the plan because at the time, there was a medium term river station on the Lesser Slave River. So the government of Alberta was collecting information monthly, but um, that was that was closed in 2019 just because of lack of resources and budget cuts. So um, there hasn't been any information collected on the river for 2019 and 2020. So um, Town of Slave Lake staff are going to come do some field training with me and they're actually going to be doing the field measurements and collecting the samples throughout summer of 2021 for us on the site that's just, uh, I guess it's in the Town of Slave Lake at near the Weir. <laughs> if people familiar with Slave Lake will know where that is. But uh, by them doing the field portion, that saves me basically like a day of travel, which costs us a lot too. So it is a, it has led to lots of other things, communication, engagement opportunities, partnerships. So that's all been really positive. Right on. So is there anything you'd like to uh, promote like projects wise or uh, places people can find you or Lesser Slave Watershed Council or any resources you wanna get out there before we sign up? Oh, sure. Well, <laughs> you can find me at our office in High Prairie, usually by myself because of the COVID. <laughs> We're all there. Um, but you can reach us at 780-523-9800. That's our phone number here at the office. You can visit our website and there's all kinds of information on there. You can click through and learn about our board, our education and outreach programs, our projects. You can find all these reports I've been talking about. And our website is www.lswc.ca. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Just look up LSWC. Um, other things to mention, if you do live in the Lesser Slave Watershed Council and you're a landowner and you've been wondering what you could do to improve your riparian area or if you live along the shore of a lake, we could help. We have um, support from the Watershed Resiliency Program to work with people one-on-one -on -one and help them implement things that will make improvements to riparian areas. So whether it's revegetating an area, help to help control erosion, um, putting in some fencing, um, different things, the utilization of off-stream watering sites. So if that piques your interest, definitely reach out to me. Awesome. And for anybody who's not in the, the Lesser Slave watershed or in the Mighty Peace watershed, um, is there a spot they can go to find their uh, their watershed council? You bet. I think if you, if you literally Google Alberta watersheds, it'll take you to the government of Alberta website and uh, all of the watershed counts, all the watershed pl planning and advisory councils are listed. So, you know, if you're in Edmonton, you fit within the North Saskatchewan, you're in Calgary, you're part of the bow. Um, and then that site will link you to the website and yeah, I re all of us have really great staff and really great programs and projects going on. So definitely reach out. East Country Beef and Forage Association is a research and extension group based out of Fairview, Alberta. Our mission is to help producers thrive in an agricultural system that is profitable, regenerative, and attractive to future generations. To learn more about what we do and see the results of our research trials or our archive of newsletters and fact sheets, check out our website at peacecountrybeef.ca. Want to get in touch? Have a burning question or a topic suggestion? Send us a message on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.